The choir now will lead us in worship as it sings, I hear a song in the garden. Thank you, choir. Indeed, what a, a great truth that changes all of history and changes our eternity, that Jesus, the very Son of God, is risen from the dead. And 
to remember that, let us go now to John chapter 20. We've been looking at different aspects of the Apostles' Creed, uh, of the confession we make concerning Christ's death and being raised now on the third day. It's so easy to say those words. It's, it's much more difficult to believe them. It takes God changing our hearts. And so we're going to look at one of the resurrection accounts today, John 20, verse 24 through 31. And hear God's word and let us stand out of honor and respect for God's word, his holy and fallible word. Again, John chapter 20, verse 24, found on page 962. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly G Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, the scripture here calls Thomas the twin. We often have another name for him, don't we? We call him Doubting Thomas. Because that's still better than saying Peeping. And you can finish it. We tend to have a negative view, though, of Thomas as a skeptic. Uh, many look at him like, kind of like Eeyore of Winnie the Pooh. And when Jesus declared himself to be the only Savior, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. Right before this, remember, Thomas asked the question, Lord, we do, not where you're, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And because of that, many think Thomas struggled with worry and anxiousness. And although we tend to look at Thomas negatively, remember, he was a chosen disciple of Christ who very likely took the gospel to India and, and died a martyr's death. And this meek disciple and, and at times bold brother who, whose failings and temperament, to be honest, many of us can empathize with and understand. This is a man that, that Jesus brought from fear to faith, calling him not to doubt but believe. And this passage teaches us that before the resurrected Lord Jesus, unbelief is a problem. It's a sin. But its remedy is a gracious, crucified, risen Lord. And this morning we begin with this fact that we have to admit that unbelief is a problem. It is a sin. This is an eyewitness account about one of the, the other appearances of, uh, of Christ after his resurrection. On the Sunday before this, on the first Easter, even with uh, the women having seen Jesus and, and telling the disciples about this, that, that he was risen, and, and although the disciples saw the empty tomb as well, what happened? The disciples were locked away because of fear, the scripture tells us. Now, we have lock-ins in the church at times as, as youth. As I get older, it's harder to do those. But that was done. We locked it up and, and kept the kids close to protect you kids and, and, and to help us keep track of you as well and your children as you entrusted them to us. And these disciples, though, were locked away because of fear and unbelief. However, now, even a week later, after Jesus showed himself to them, they were locked away again. 
want you to think about this because sometimes when things don't go our way, the way we thought they should, when pressure, pressure hits us or, or we just don't know what to do in a situation, we lock down, don't we? We separate ourselves in our room, uh, we become couch potatoes, or, or we go maybe on a walk or, or some other special place. I always like the story of Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of John and Charles Wesley, the hymn writers. And she had many, many children. And the only escape she had was to pull her apron over her head and to pray. <laughs> she had no other way to separate herself out, out from the family. And now verse 24 tells us Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. What's that saying? He missed church. And the blessing of seeing the one who died and rose again to give us eternal life. That's a tragedy. Because you think about it, God does some of the most incredible things and some amazing things when his people gather. Look at the Old Testament. God called the people to gather and prepare themselves before he gave them the Ten Commandments. It was when, God, when the people of God had gathered around the tabernacle that the Shekinah glory, God's glory, came down both there and to the tabernacle and to the temple. And you can look at even these resurrection appearances of Jesus and then to Pentecost as well. And if you're not here, you will miss out on blessing, of being reminded of our Lord's faithfulness, and His tender mercies, and His love and His sovereign control over our lives, even turning disasters for our good. For the good of those who love him. That's why missing out with the joining of God's people is a disaster. <coughs> Thomas's isolation, even from imperfect believers, even like we are, helped feed his doubt. Jesus had told, think about it again, Jesus had told the disciples over and over, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I will, I'll suffer and die, and the Son of Man will suffer and die and rise again the third day. They saw Jesus raise Lazarus. They saw him raise others from the dead. Now they died again. Jesus wouldn't. And now after the other disciples saw the physically risen Lord, what does Thomas say? We see this in our text this morning. Unless I see in his hands the prints of the nail and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Doesn't Jesus command that we believe in him in John 14 in that precious passage? Or in Mark 11, doesn't he say, have faith in God? See, that means not to believe. <coughs> to doubt is sin. And to fail to repent and turn from this sin will bring the judgment of God. For the sin of being cowardly and unbelieving are included in Revelation 21 in the list of those who will be damned forever and get under God's wrath. To doubt God's promises is not a good place to be. Scripture tells us, for without faith, it's impossible to believe God. And where does God nurture our faith? It's where the pure word of God is preached. And with this, we need to understand, as our all-knowing triune God knows, too, on this side of eternity, we walk by faith and not by sight. That means at the same time, as we know that this is a sin, we all struggle with varying degrees of doubts which cloud our faith in the risen Lord and Savior. Again, remember, none of the other disciples at first believed Jesus' promises. They didn't believe the first eyewitnesses' accounts that came back to them. But here we see particular Thomas persisted and continued to wrestle with doubt. I make it personal. I know myself, it's so tempting to be, let's call it a defensive pessimist. Just makes it sound nice, doesn't it? Because if we expect the worst and it happens, we're not disappointed, right? Well, it's dangerous to use doubt as an excuse to sin. And some treacherously use it in pride, 
again, to excuse sin or, or even to deny Jesus as Lord, lying to themselves. Well, you know, they're saying, I, I'm, I'm just being intellectually honest. God actually says something else. He says they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Then there's also doubters like Thomas who hate their doubts, which make them miserable. Perhaps in, in a way, too, that, that, that this type of doubt in some ways, although, although Thomas's was, was stronger than this, uh, but, but there may be like the father of the demoniac who cried out with tears saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We're not going to be perfectly believe until we get to glory. And again, all the disciples were slow to believe, showing they didn't fabricate or make up the stories about Jesus' bodily resurrection. And yet their faith was strengthened as they saw him and ate with him over and over again. And Jesus, or John is recording all this so that we would believe, so our faith would be strengthened. And it's important that we answer another question here. Uh, what is the answer to our doubt, to unbelief? Well, unbelief's remedy is the gracious, risen Lord Jesus Christ. If you're struggling with doubt this morning, how can someone rid themselves of it? Is it that we maybe find all the answers to all the questions we have about everything in this world that God has made, but God will not answer every one of our questions for the scripture tells us the secret things belong to God, but the things he has revealed belong to us and our children. But God does, in the pages of his word, answer the questions about being saved by grace through faith alone in, in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus coming to the ten disciples and then to Thomas is actually what cured their doubt. God coming to us, working in our hearts. Notice what Jesus says in verse 26. He didn't scold them or chew them out, and I think that's important for us to remember too when people do ask us questions. I, I pray that I never do that to you. Uh, if I do, challenge me as your pastor. But, but ask me those questions. But notice what Jesus says. He says, peace to you. See, we, we can never gather enough evidence to make someone believe. We can't gather enough evidence to make our own hearts believe because sin has darkened our hearts. And notice when Jesus reveals evidences to his resurrection, which shows the Heavenly Father has accepted the sacrifice of his righteous Son for our sins, notice the response. It says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad. When they saw the Lord. Why does God, I mean, God has not saved us outside of evidence, but th this shows our triune God does not use evidence as the basis of our faith. I'm going to believe whether that impression on the mountain of Ararat is, is Noah's ark or not. I'm still going to believe what God has said. But the Lord gives us evidence to strengthen the eyes of faith and make our hearts glad. And then notice Jesus piled on more grace in verse 27. He turns to Thomas. He says, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. See, the Holy Spirit has this recorded for us. Because the Son of God, as Hebrews 4 tells us, sympathizes with our weaknesses. He was tempted, even as we are tempted to doubt, and yet he was without doubt, without sin. And so we need to patiently and graciously and prayerfully argue the truth to our own hearts, even as we speak to others about Jesus. We need to pray that God will change hearts according to his plan. We need to speak to others, yes, about God fulfilling every promise in Christ, the many witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, to never die again in the Gospels and, and in 1 Corinthians 15. We need to be gracious to them. 
about this because the Lord is still being gracious with you and I when we don't get it like, you, like we should. I, as your pastor, don't always get it like I should. And notice Jesus invited Thomas to check out the facts. Interestingly enough, it doesn't seem like Thomas actually touched Jesus. <laughs> because it says Thomas, Jesus replies to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. What Jesus is saying here, it's not about having enough evidence. We can't demand of the Son of God to pull back the, the, the roof of this building and come right here to show himself physically. He's already shown himself and revealed himself to us by the reports of many eyewitnesses of his resurrection. He's done that through his spirit, recording it for us in this infallible word so that we may believe, so that we may have life in his name, as John says here. Yet the enemy of our souls doesn't want us to look at God's word. He wants us to get distracted. Look, look elsewhere. Look at our own emotions. And so when we try to talk to loved ones or friends about Jesus, we also are tempted to think, well, you know, emotionally, if only I can say the right thing, I, I pile up enough evidence, they'll believe then. No. To be honest, what makes us poor at witnessing is we think that the converting of hearts and tearing down of doubts comes by what we do, not by the Word of God. Think about it. No amount of the disciples arguing with Thomas changed his mind. We need the triune God to come to us, to convert us. We need the Holy Spirit who works faith to work applying the word of God to destroy our doubts and to calm our fears. Because I can't change my own heart, let alone somebody else's. <coughs> Same is true for you. So we need to pray for God to work his irresistible grace. We need to pray that God would bless this church and, and that our witness would become stronger. And, and we need to be reading God's word to other people, we need to be memorizing the scripture, passage by passage, and, and, and feed that to others bit by bit, not to make them have to swallow the whole Bible in one bite, though, but to plant the seed and water the seed of the gospel. And thankfully, the love, love of God, and we do this with the confidence that the love of God is more powerful than locked doors that we set up for ourselves with our doubts and our fears. And there's not a single doubt which God cannot shatter. Think of Paul, who in obstinate unbelief persecuted Christians until the risen Lord literally stopped him in his tracks. So go to God. Read his word. Ask the Holy Spirit to work in you, your loved ones, and your friends show and strengthen you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ who was crucified, dead and buried for our sins and, and rose again for our justification. In other words, to make you and I right with God. We don't do it. Christ does it. And notice the result of Jesus' work in Thomas. He went from doubts of unbelief to the joy of worship, declaring in verse 28, my Lord and my God. We need to pray for that work in us. We need to fall down and worship, even sometimes when we don't feel like it. Emotions will come later, because God will work it by his word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, doubt will not be destroyed by some mystical or miraculous vision, but by the Holy Spirit coming to us, revealing the risen Son of God, giving us insight, and understanding into God's word, bowing the knee to it. Jesus took two of his disciples on the Emmaus Road, and, and it says, Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. Others in history, like the Harvard lawyer Simon Greenlee, he set out to destroy Christianity. He was going to write a book about it, in fact, and particularly attacking the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet the risen Lord worked in his heart by his Holy Spirit as he read God's word. He, he wrote quite a different book supporting 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Same thing happened to Lee Strobel, which he writes about in the book, The Case for Christ. Here in John, Jesus came to Thomas. Our merciful Lord comes to us, comes to his doubting, struggling disciples, and he turns Thomas's doubt to faith, to believing the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So take your doubts, take your fears to the Lord. Ask him to work. Gather other believers. Ask them to pray also. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring you to Christ, working faith, gladness, and even peace and joy and believing in you. And pray for that for others as well. Because the doubt of unbelief is a sin. It's a problem. And its only remedy is the gracious, risen Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, as fearful and doubting as we can be, Come to us. Reveal yourself to us in your word. Help us to see with the eyes of faith the nail-scarred hands and feet the pierced side, which are marks that you, Lord Jesus, our Savior, bore our sins. Even as you cried out, Father, forgive them. You accomplished that even because you declared even from the cross, it is finished to declare our salvation. The salvation of those brought to faith and repentance. Sinners like us, Tell us we are forgiven. Help us to repent and believe. Help us even to look forward to the time where faith will be made sight, when we get to see the glorified body of you, Lord Jesus Christ, with your wounds, which, which you gladly wear, even in glory. And we will be glad, in fact, more joyful than we've ever known before. Till that glorious day, strengthen the faith which is weak, remove the doubts of unbelief from our hearts and from other hearts. Work in us the true faith and a heart of worship that we may always cry out to you, to, to you, Lord Jesus, our risen Lord, along with Thomas, saying joyfully, my Lord and my God. We pray this in the name, in your name, the name of our, risen and cruci our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.